Hi, everybody. Hello. My lovely, mighty audience. Uh, my name is Patty, and I manage public programs here at California Historical Society. Um, if you haven't been here before, you're right in the middle of our Alexander Hamilton exhibition, Treasures from the New York Historical Society, um, which has manuscripts and documentation and cast iron statues perpetually in duel, uh, related to the epic duel between Ale uh, Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr. And then the side galleries, we'd be remiss if we didn't have something California related. So we have Meanwhile Out West, all about the same time period through the West Coast perspective of the Hamilton lifetime. So looking at the um, 1700s to the 1820s. So come back or look at the exhibit after the program tonight. Uh, I'm really excited to introduce um, Wendy and Hand to Hand tonight. So I found Wendy through the NYU. I was flipping through the catalog and I was just struck by the cover. And when I purchased my own copy, I read it and I just thought it was a powerful history of this really interesting time um, in American history, in California history. And I just knew that I wanted to have Wendy here and speak. And lo and behold, she was in San Jose, so she wasn't even that far away. So super happy to have her and Hand in Hand from Oakland tonight. So I get to introduce all of them. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about our structure tonight, but we're going to learn some moves as well. So get ready for that. Um, uh, Wendy L. Rouse, Rouse, perfect, is an assistant professor at San Jose State University, where she teaches courses in history and teacher preparation. Rouse's scholarly research focuses on the history of women and children in the United States during the progressive era. Hand to Hand is one of the oldest continually operating self-defense training centers in the United States. Hand to Hand is a supportive and professional environment for learning skills that enable everyone to live more safely. We spe they specialize in um, practical, comprehensive women's self-defense and relies on effective physical, verbal, and emotional strategies. In this highly supportive environment, students learn to protect themselves from invasive and dangerous situations, including physical assault. They'll gain insights into the complexities of violence in our culture and become aware of how we are all impacted by sexism, racism, and gender oppression, regardless of our personal identities. Hand-in-hand -hand classes explore the links between personal safety and community wellness because seeing this connection provides an opportunity for healing and encourages every individual to walk fearlessly in their lives. I'm so glad to have them here. I'm so glad to have Wendy here. I'm really excited to hear the presentation and learn more about this history. Um, so she'll speak for about 45 minutes. Then uh, we'll have the quick sort of demo with hand to hand. We'll learn some moves. And then we'll open it up to questions. You'll be all ready to ask some questions, be bold. And then we'll have a book signing and reception at the end. So stick around for a wonderful night. So I'm going to hand it over to Wendy. In 1905, Nellie Griffin was a telephone operator in Oakland, California, and she was walking home from work one night when a guy started following her. And this would be terrifying to us today, and it was to her at the time. So she didn't know what to do, but she decided she better walk faster, try to get home quicker. So she started to walk faster, and he kept following her. And she'd look behind, he was still there. And eventually he started saying things to her that started to make her uncomfortable. So again, she sped up, tried to move along, um, and he caught up with her and he grabbed her by the arm. Now at this point, she was terrified. Uh, she was angry. So she turned around and she punched him square in the nose. He was shocked and he backed off and uh, somebody started calling for the police and the police came and eventually the uh, newspaper reporter showed up to interview her and say, why did you do that? Why did you punch him in the nose? And what she said is kind of interesting. She said, if you could be forced to stand everlasting insults that a woman is, you could understand why I acted as I did tonight. I've waited too long for some bystander to take up the fight for me, but no one has ever volunteered, so I was compelled to assert my rights. This is a powerful statement if you think about it. It's 100 years ago, and what she's saying essentially is she has the right to defend herself, and she has the ability to defend herself. Remember, this is during a time when women were being told that they weren't very strong, they weren't very powerful, that they needed men to think for them, to act for them, to protect them. So she's boldly saying she has the right and the ability to defend herself. This is the time's up, me too moment of 100 years ago. We think it's current, we think it's now, but it actually goes quite a ways back in time. And essentially women had been fighting for their political, social, and economic freedoms for hundreds of years. And at this point, they were especially fighting for basic things, like their right to walk down the street, 
free from sexual harassment and assault. They were fighting for the right to vote. They were fighting for their political freedoms, free from sexual harassment and assault. They were fighting for uh, their right to go to school, to pursue a career of their choice, free from sexual harassment and assault. And they were fighting for their right to live in equal and loving marriages, free from sexual harassment and assault. I wanted to write this book um, in part, it's actually kind of funny, because I should have started writing it much earlier in my life. I had trained in martial arts since I was 10 years old. I'd studied a lot of different um, martial arts systems. And I actually even went on to become a historian by training. I went to school, got my bachelor's degree in history, my master's degree in history, my PhD in history. And that whole time, I never really thought about writing the history of women's self-defense or women in martial arts at all. I think part of it was because we had been taught that our teachers were the first generation of women to kind of break that barrier and to go out and train with men and to train in a predominantly uh, male sport. So it never dawned on me that it might have a longer history. But I was working on another project, another research project, and I was going through the newspapers of 100 years ago, and it's at that point that the image that's now the cover of the book really struck me. And on the cover of the book, there's this woman, and she's fighting back, and she's using jujitsu against an attacker. And I was just like, what is this? And it challenged everything that I thought I knew about my own history and training in martial arts and about the history of women in general. So I had to know more. So I started researching it from there, and eventually it, it became the book. And what I learned in, in brief is that the history of women's self-defense has paralleled the history of women's rights movements in general. So we often talk about like, there being different waves of women's rights. So just as there was the second wave of, of feminism in 1960s and 70s when women were increasingly participating in self-defense classes, there's also this first wave that paralleled the fight for the right to vote in the early 1900s. So my book actually looks at the period before 1920 when we had no idea that women were training in, in martial arts. And it kind of explores that specific time period. So... Um, this is the book cover photo, that the original uh, article that I found, Every Woman Her Own Bodyguard, that I was like so surprised by. It's kind of a cool picture. Uh, the Art of Feminine Self-Defense. Cool. So the first chapter in the book looks at boxing specifically. I have two chapters that explore the types of martial arts that women trained in. And I wanted to understand what brought them to this type of training. And boxing is interesting because uh, women traditionally were seen as weaker than men and physically incapable of participating in any kind of sport. And as you probably learned, they very gradually began to get involved in different types of athletics and eventually, you know, oh, it's okay to ride a bicycle and, and play tennis and things like that. Um, but at the turn of the century, there was this major fad that kind of took hold of the country with people wanting to improve their physical health. And Teddy Roosevelt was a big part of this. He was an advocate. He, uh, he was president of the United States at the time, and he wanted everybody to really get in shape, get physically fit. And this was part of a larger kind of movement that was taking place. And boxing was seen as the ultimate kind of manly sport. If you wanted to get in physical shape, then it was perfect for that. If you wanted to improve your ability to fight back against someone, and then it was perfect for that as well. It was believed to be the manly art because it shaped not only your, your body, but your character. So a lot of men started to train in boxing, but they, they wanted to train in boxing, but they didn't really want to get too hurt in training in boxing because it was a very dangerous sport as well. And there was this history of these uh, prize fights that would, end very, that would be very bloody and dangerous. So what they did is they developed kind of a new form of boxing that was for manly men, but gentlemanly men as well. And so they would go and they would practice some light sparring, some bag work, uh, shadow boxing, nothing too intense, but just enough to make them feel like they were getting stronger and to learn some self-defense. So this became really, really popular at the time. And uh, women also started to take boxing lessons. Many of these women in the photos that I'm showing you are college-educated women because by the 1890s, by 1900, there was this first kind of generation of women, this was actually the second generation of women, that were, had gone to college. And they had the money, they had the time, after they graduated from college, they wanted to take, continue their training, their education, and their athletic 
a training. So they would often go to gyms, and they would see men training in boxing, and this would be something that appealed to them as well. So women would pay the boxing instructors to in include them in the lessons, and it became really common to see women training in boxing. But of course, the response was that uh, it's going to make you too masculine, too manly, it's going to make women into physical freaks. So one common reaction to that was for boxing instructors and for women who train in boxing to say, no, 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 actually quite the opposite. It will make them more beautiful, more feminine. So if you look at this article here, it says, uh, just how the summer girl proposes to maintain her physical perfection through boxing training. Um, so it, this was a common response, was just to say basically that it was going to improve women's feminine beauty. And in fact, they said it could, it could prevent feminine hysterics. It could prevent women's catty disposition. You know, solve all your PMS symptoms, basically. Um, so women and children even trained in boxing. This is a boxing instructor named jo Johnny Kilbane, and he was actually showing how women and children could train. Jiu-Jitsu also became quite the fad in um, this early time period. Right around 1900, 1904, there was growing interest in Japan. Japan had just defeated Russia in the Russo-Japanese War, and American political leaders were really interested in them as a military power, and specifically in this whole idea of Jiu-Jitsu and that they were these elite kind of fighting forces. So Teddy Roosevelt, which we've already kind of mentioned him, he plays an important role in all this, he was a boxer at Harvard, and uh, he was very concerned about staying in shape and developing his physique and developing his abilities overall. And he uh, really enjoyed all things martial culture, right? So he enjoyed um, boxing and wrestling. So when he heard about jiu-jitsu, he wanted to know more. So he invited jiu-jitsu instructors to the White House to show him some techniques, and he loved it. He ended up wrestling with them, um, having different... Uh, competitions between himself and them or inviting top-notch wrestlers to compete so he could see who was better. And he had a really great time and he wrote to his sons all about it and he, he was really enjoying it. Um, we have pictures because it was a high-profile event. They took a lot of photo ops to show that the president was studying jiu-jitsu. He could hold his own. Um, and in these photos, you see that they trained side by side and learned together. But in the end, Roosevelt said that boxing was the superior art, and Western men were superior men, and maybe, maybe they should learn just a little bit of jiu-jitsu to re maintain that, to their supremacy. Um, and he, he felt that it was really to the best interest of American men to pick up some techniques so that they could continue to be able to compete in the world stage. So he actually recommended that his jiu-jitsu instructor be hired by the military academy to train the military. And uh, so it became part of the military training for a while with the boys in the academy learning all different types of boxing, wrestling, and jiu-jitsu. So kind of a mixed martial art emerged at the time. So by World War I, uh, the military was actively practicing a sort of mixed martial art. And after these guys graduated from the academy or they came back from combat duty, a lot of them opened up their own self-defense schools and they started training, like I said, kind of the first type of MMA with boxing, wrestling, and jiu-jitsu. So this is an ad um, in 1921 in a boys' magazine, basically marketing this type of mixed martial art class to young men, saying, would you be able to hold your own? Would you be able to defend your woman on the street should you be attacked or robbed? Um, so this idea that it was the manly art it continued this idea that you needed to be able to protect yourself uh, as well. But women at the same time were kind of challenging this idea of it being the manly art. And the story is that 
Teddy Roosevelt, you know, was always doing these big stunts, these physical feats. And there was a woman who really hated him, and her name was Martha Wadsworth. And she did not like the fact that he was always posturing for the press and doing all these things to get attention. So whenever he would do some sort of physical feat, she would mimic it and then show that women could do it too. So she, of course, decided, oh, he's doing jiu-jitsu? Great, I'll hire the uh, jiu-jitsu instructor's wife, who was also a black belt equivalent at that time, um, to train in uh, martial arts as well. So she hired uh, the jiu-jitsu instructor's wife, and they ended up training a group of women and children on the lawn of the White House in jiu-jitsu. And we have some photos of this because, of course, they invited the press as well. So these are some of the girls that were training with the jiu-jitsu instructor. Basically, what they were saying is that the manly art is the womanly art, and they were kind of challenging it. They, these women were very powerful. They were the wives of congressmen, children of, of congressmen, and they were making their point that this was a political thing as well. This was showing women were equal to men. Okay, so really the main reason that most women wanted to study martial art was for self-defense. Just like today, women train in jiu-jitsu or boxing or some sort of self-defense um, because they want to be prepared to protect themselves on the street. At this time, in the, in the mid to late 19th century, there was this idea of separate spheres, right? This idea that the woman's place is in the home and the man's place is in public on the city street, earning a living, right, out, going out into the world. But this was changing. Women had been challenging this for quite some time. And by 1900, women were out getting jobs in the city. They were going to school, as we mentioned. Um, they were going to the city for, for recreation and for leisure. I mean, they were, they were challenging this. But... There was backlash. There were men who said, this is the city street, this is our space, you shouldn't be here. And one common form of backlash was the, the masher. And so this is not a term that we have today, so it's always hard to explain it, but the masher is basically what we would call a street harasser today, something like that. Um, but even more than that, the masher could do everything from just be like mildly flirting with a woman to full-on trying to attack or sexually assault a woman. So the masher term was used quite broadly. It was a broad range of, of actions that was defined as a masher. Um, but the masher threat was very real. Women described being, being ogled by men on the street, goo-goo eyes, they would say at the time, um, that men would follow them, they would say inappropriate things, they would make unsolicited comments about their body, um, or they would sit next to them really close on the streetcar and, and touch them or try to get closer to them, put their arm around them, around their waist, uh, or sometimes just try to attack them. And so this was a problem so much so that women began to speak out about it very publicly and say, we need to do something. We're tired of this happening every time we leave uh, the house. But of course, you can imagine that the common response to them was, well, then don't leave the house. Go back to where you're supposed to be. Or bring your husband with you. Where's your husband? Where's your boyfriend? Where's your father? You need a male protector. That's the whole point. Uh, so they had a lot of negative reaction to just bringing up the issue of the masher threat. Um, but like I said, this was the Me Too moment of 100 years ago. So they kept bringing it up. They demanded that people listen, that this was an issue that they wanted addressed. They brought it up to their families. They brought it up to the police. They asked for law enforcement to crack down on this. They asked for the courts to take it seriously and not just let this slide, but to actually punish the offenders. And eventually they got so fed up, they said, well, we'll, we'll do what we have to do to protect ourselves. So that's where the self-defense movement really took off at the time. Um, this one is the same uh, boxing instructor teaching women self-defense to protect against mashers on the street. So women went to these boxing instructors, these jiu-jitsu instructors, and began to ask for techniques that would help them protect themselves against mashers. And it worked. There was a stenographer in New York, and um, she s did the same thing that Nellie Griffin did. A guy came up to her and started harassing her, so she punched him. And people said, why did you do that? And she said, the police, they can't be everywhere at once. So I did what I had to do to protect myself. 
Um, and there were some women, too, that were saying that they needed to learn verbal self-defense as well, to be able to define their boundaries and claim their right to exist in the public space. There was a woman, she was riding on a streetcar, and a guy was getting really into her space and trying to, you know, intimidate her and, and whatnot. And so she finally just stood up and really loudly yelled, the two of us can't ride this car together, and I'm not leaving. And he was, like, so embarrassed that she had called attention to it that he kind of slunk away. But it was that whole idea, and she said, we have this power in, within ourselves to kind of speak out and to be loud and to be bold. And remember, this is a time when women were told to keep their head down, don't make eye contact with anyone on the street, try to, try to, try to not engage in any way and, and just get to where you've got to go because it's, it's very dangerous for you to be on the street. So this idea that they're saying, we have the right to exist here and you can't intimidate me is a really, really powerful thing. So they signed up for self-defense classes. But this was, I mean, let's be honest, this is a, mostly a middle and upper class privilege to be able to sign up for these self-defense classes. It takes money. So the average woman wouldn't necessarily be able to do this. And the newspapers, I think, realized that, and they started to print tutorials in the paper, and also it probably sold a lot of newspapers. Um, and they had these step-by-step -step how to protect yourself, uh, using your umbrella, using a hat pin, or just using common everyday items in the bottom one, she's using the guy's coat to subdue him, which is kind of funny. There's all these different examples of what you can do when someone attacks you. I actually found the photos, the original photos. So that was one way that women could also get self-defense training is by these step-by-step -step, uh, tutorials in the newspapers. There were some books that were published and there were films that were made as well to help women learn self-defense. Uh, there was a ba some backlash against this too, just like there was with women training in boxing and jiu-jitsu and the idea that it might be masculinizing to them. And one common thing was to say, well, what would you do now because um, who's going to be the protector? So these videos are supposed to be funny, but they reflect that idea of the backlash. So again, it's supposed to be funny because she's protecting him. She then becomes the natural protector and it reverses that, what we think is supposed to be normal in this situation. So it is kind of a little bit of a backlash. This one shows um, sexual harassment in the workplace, which I thought was really interesting, which a lot of women were also bringing attention to. <laughs> I think that one's really funny. So this, this public discussion about self-defense allowed them to start talking about some of these issues, even if it's just in a humorous way. They're raising these issues about sexual harassment in the workplace. 
Okay, so we know, like I said, this was the first wave of feminism um, with the fight for the right to vote. And the issue of self-defense becomes very explicit with this movement as well. Um, this is a quote from Susan B. Anthony, who everybody knows who Susan B. Anthony is. And she said, I declare to you that woman must not depend on the protection of man, but must be taught to protect herself. And there I take my stand. Now she said this in 1871 right here in San Francisco. And in this context, she's actually talking about women need the right to vote in order to protect themselves, that they could then pass laws against uh, violence, uh, against all kinds of harassment, and then they would be able to protect themselves in a variety of ways. But some of the suffragists saw the very real implications of physical training in order to protect themselves. And this is most explicit with the women in uh, the suffrage movement, especially in England. Um, they faced a lot of harassment from anti-suffragists and from people who just didn't like the fact that they were out protesting on the street. Uh, they were often harassed, uh, name calling. They sometimes were knocked down, kicked, shoved. In this case, these guys just grabbed a suffragette banner and they ran off and they were kind of mocking the women. Um, so it was a constant problem. And especially in, in the UK, it was an issue. The women there were pelted with rotten fruit. They had urine soaked rags thrown at them. Uh, and it got real violent. Um, the police were not very kind at all, and they used a lot of very vicious techniques to try to subdue them. And the movement there was growing more and more radical every day. And one part of this was, of their radicalization, was the training in jiu-jitsu. There was an instructor there named Edith Garrod, and she was insistent that if the suffragists learned self-defense, they would be able to protect themselves a little bit more than they were at the present time. So she actually, this is a ad from the suffragette newspaper where she was advertising her services, come and learn self-defense, and I'll be able to show you what you can do to counter the anti-suffragists or to counter the police as necessary. And this became a very popular class, and they actually had a group of women who trained as the bodyguards, they called themselves, and they would train in self-defense and then protect some of the leaders of the movement. Uh, when they were about to be arrested, they would try to resist and help them escape. And of course, this generated a lot of media attention and some backlash as well, with people making fun of them. Oh, look at the suffragette. She knows jujitsu. Look how scary she is. The police are terrified of her. So kind of mocking them. And this idea that they're becoming masculine. They're acting more like men. They're man-hating. They're going to trample on the police, gang up on the police. They're not very loving. They're the opposite of what we would expect with women. Women are supposed to be compassionate, the moral guardians of the household. And these women were clearly stepping outside the bounds. The fact that they were demanding the same rights as men, the right to vote, seemed like um, an affront. So this was reflecting that. Um, there was a woman who came from the United States and went to train, or went to uh, work with the suffragists in England. And she believed over time, she came to believe in this idea of studying self-defense. She, her and her mother were both very active, and her mother was arrested at one point for protesting, and she was put in jail as she went on a hunger strike, which was a common tactic that they used back then, and she was force-fed. And by the time they got out of prison, the suffragists who experienced this had become heroes within the movement, so they had a big rally for them. And at this rally, one of the suffragists said, I went in militant, but I came out raging fire. And the daughter, Elsie Chapin, the girl who was involved in all this, she heard this and she felt the same way. She felt this like fire raging inside her. So again, she became more and more radicalized. So toward the end, she started demanding jujitsu and, and boxing classes and she organized the suffragists in her little group as well. So these were American women who went and trained with the jujitsu suffragists of the, of the era. And there was another woman from Michigan, actually, and she met Sylvia Pankhurst, one of the leaders of the UK suffrage movement, in Chicago. And she ended up going with Sylvia back to England and got involved in the movement there. And again, she gradually also became much more radical. Um, at one point, her skull was fractured by the police batons when she was arrested. Uh, she was injured very severely, and then it happened again. Again, her skull was fractured. So she started training in jiu-jitsu, and her and Sylvia actually organized what they called the People's Army, 
which was a group of men and women um, who were trained in jujitsu and boxing and prepared to protect and defend each other. And they actually started carrying around clubs. So this is toward the end, and they got um, pretty extreme with that. And we don't know, uh, we know that they said that they had several battles with the police by, by 1913. Um, and this is an image that has recently surfaced where we think that the suffragist here that's being arrested is carrying clubs in her hand there, and the police are trying to take the clubs away. These were Indian clubs that were used, that they called them Indian clubs. They were like weights that they would use for workout, uh, but they started carrying them for self-defense. Now, all this talk about suffragists studying jiu-jitsu and all the talk about the masher and street violence really deflected the blame for the, for the problem uh, from the real issue. The real sources of violence against women was something that people wanted to talk about. Um, the truth is that people even today want to talk about the shadowy stranger, right? Like the person who is hiding behind the bushes is going to jump out and, and, and kill you. And this is often described as the other, someone... Uh, some non-white, uh, maybe an immigrant, uh, maybe, um, and I know blacks were often depicted as race as rapists. Um, Asian American, Chinese American men were often depicted as sexual predators. Um, Southern and Eastern Europeans were often depicted as white slave traders. So this was kind of used to perpetuate that stereotype. But the truth is and was at the time that the vast majority of women were most at risk, not on the street, but in their homes and not from some stranger, but from someone that they love. And there were a few radical feminists who were bringing this up at this moment, in this public moment of discussing the Me Too and, and Time's Up. They were bringing up this issue of violence against women. Now, in Chicago, around 1905, there was a huge number of women that were killed. And the newspapers would run these he horrific headlines all the time about these women being killed. And of course, they tried to portray it as these women being killed by the shadowy stranger on the street, and that the streets were dangerous and women need to stay inside and stay away, that it's, it's very dangerous. And when I was finding examples from this era of women uh, needing to study self-defense or wanting to study self-defense, I found that this was one of the primary motivators, is these very high-profile cases of women being stalked and murdered on the streets. So I saw this year, and I was curious about it, um, and so I went back and I researched not only this year, but the five years leading up to it in Chicago and all the murders of the women that had taken place during that time period. And what I found was that there was 99 women murdered, but 85% of them were killed by men they knew, their husbands, their lovers, their neighbors, friends. And of course, 67% were killed at home or at work. And these numbers, I, I'd say that they were surprising to me, but they, they're not because these numbers are very similar to the situation today. So this idea of the shadowy stranger was being used to sell self-defense classes, but it was ignoring this radical truth that even, like I said, some feminists at the time were pointing out, that women were most at risk uh, in their own homes. Um, and these numbers are actually higher because these only include the ones that I could confirm who killed them and where. There's uh, several that I cannot confirm. So that's, um, I expect that they're, they're a little bit higher too. Now, Charlotte Perkins Gilman, she was one of the people who raised this issue up. And she said, there's this popular masculine myth that assumes that man is woman's natural protector. But in fact, he's often the worst danger that she can hope to meet. So she was talking directly about this issue, that man is not woman's natural protector, that he is dangerous, that he is the one that is typically uh, more likely to, uh, to attack her, the, the man in her home, the man that she loves. And she also made an interesting point when she said, Men possess an underlying fear that sometime, somewhere, somehow, women might hit back and rebel against the oppressor. And it's interesting, if you read some of her fiction, um, she talks about women training in jiu-jitsu and boxing. And it was her belief that if women trained in jiu-jitsu and boxing, they would be more empowered and more physically able to protect themselves if need be. And she believed that they were capable of it. And she was really countering this idea that women are weak, that they're weaker than men. She was saying, no, women are capable of protecting themselves. And they should learn to protect themselves because we don't know uh, what's going to happen in their lives. And this, this natural protector is not so uh, protecting. But again, um, there was backlash. Uh, one common thing was to say, uh, if women learn jiu-jitsu or boxing, they'll take it out on their husbands. This idea of inverting that, that idea of violence in the home and saying that women will become the violent ones in the home. So in this case, you have a woman who's not only empowered physically, 
but she's a suffragist in the back. It says votes for women on one of those uh, banners behind her. And so she's not only politically empowered and physically empowered, but she's also uh, now turned her violence and her anger against her husband. So it's this idea that women can be dangerous if they're allowed too much freedom and too much political or physical power. And there's lots of examples of this. These were really common postcards at the time to show women eating up their husbands. And again, it was supposed to be funny, but it was also commentary on this fear. So over and over again, you see this as a common theme. So uh, again, I studied the period before 1920, but obviously women continued training in, in self-defense and jiu-jitsu and boxing and all sorts of martial arts that came from uh, different parts of the world. And in the 1920s and 1950s, women continued to train. Uh, but it would become really, really popular again in the 1960s and the 70s with second wave feminism. And you would see, again, with this resurgence of the women's movement and demands for economic equality and social equality, women would again empower themselves physically, empower their bodies, and insist on their right to be able to protect themselves and fight back. And again, we, there's a girl power movement in the 1990s where you saw a lot of powerful women in movies and TV that were, that were physically capable of protecting themselves. So again, we saw a resurgence of the self-defense movement during that time, and a lot of women... Maybe even you took a class during that period, and maybe you first learned about self-defense during that era. So it tends to parallel these periods of women's power. Well, who's your boyfriend, girls? He seems a bit down on his luck. Uh, won't someone present him? Well, what are we waiting for? Okay, let's dance. <laughs> that guy's a flop. The engaging little lady is Mrs. Grace Gerard, the only woman in New York City who teaches jiu-jitsu. At 63 years of age, she demonstrates the etiquette of situation control, and the girls lean over backward in their efforts to learn how to keep a man on his ear till an introduction can be arranged. Grace claims that there's nothing unusual about her occupation, that women have always known how to handle men, she merely improves their technique. Ordinary methods of pursuit are still effective, but a girl should know how to hold her man. This hold is known as the masher's wrist lock. He can't get away. And this is the burglar bend, or the maiden lady's last resort. Well, there's nothing left but the strangle hold. If the fall guy should survive, well, he'll be as dippy as a donut. I'm interesting. The commentary is equally interesting, right? Always got to make a joke of it because it's so serious, I guess. Um, so today... Uh, it continues to remain popular. Empowerment self-defense courses or feminist self-defense courses have their roots back in the era of the 60s and the 70s. And I would argue even further back into this first wave that we've been talking about. Empowerment self-defense classes focus on women's physical but also their personal empowerment. Talk about setting boundaries, de-escalation, uh, assertiveness training especially, verbal and psychological strategies, thinking about gender socialization and its role in perpetuating violence or um, and, and examining rape culture, connections with sex, sexism, racism, and classism, and ultimately holding per perpetrators responsible. So there's a lot of choices for self-defense classes today, but this type of self-defense is really important because it has its roots in these earlier eras that we've been studying. And if you can find empowerment self-defense classes, like we'll be talking with hand-to-hand -hand about a lot of the work that they do, then it, it helps to look at this larger culture of violence against women. So self-defense training really emerged during this early period um, as a way for women to assert their rights, to, to claim their right to public space, and to assert their rights to social, political, and economic equality. Uh, women were saying enough is enough. They're physically strong enough. They're capable enough. They're smart enough to be able to protect themselves. And they don't need necessarily this male protector to be able to think for them, to vote for them, to protect them, that they can do it themselves. And so this is, this is really interesting and empowering because women are boldly saying that time's up, we're doing this, this is our way of fighting back. And I want to end with actually what was my favorite video from this early period, showing um, a really, really good martial artist um, showing women's self-defense. <laughs>
soon as I realize I'm going to be attacked, I hold my bag more firmly to my side. I grip his wrist, draw his arm forwards and upwards, and place my disengaged arm across his body. In this position, it's quite easy for me to dislocate his elbow. Although his other arm is free, it's quite impossible for him to strike me, as I'm nearly. As soon as I feel his arm around my neck, I lean slightly forward, grip his wrist and elbow, and by bending my knees, I lower my center of gravity, roughly speaking, my hips below his center of gravity, and by bending sharply forward, Notice I do not attempt to break away from his grip, but by bending well back, encourage his weight onto his toes. I turn my body, place his arm under mine, and in this position, it's quite easy for me to dislocate his wrist, elbow, up, shoulder. I catch his ankle, place my hand between his shoulders, and kick away his only support. Now I'm going to give him a real throw. I'm gripped in the same manner as before, the tramp not having learned his lesson. This time I draw his body upwards till it's in the form of a hoop. I lie gently on the floor, placing one foot in his tummy. The answer's in the infirmary. Wonderful. Oh, okay, let's all take a deep breath in and reach your hands up. Stretch out your hips and stretch over to one side and over to the other side. Great. And shake it out a little bit. Great. So my name is Aminta and this is Christine and we're from the Hand to Hand Community Self-Defense Center and we're located in Oakland. Um, and as Wendy said, and I actually didn't even know until I heard her say it, um, we're one of the longest continuously operating women's self-defense centers. That's great to know. So we've been around for more than 35 years. Um, I've been teaching for about the last 20 years or so, um, and so has Christine. So we're going to go in a little bit into what is self-defense and then also give you an experience of uh, participating in self-defense and teach you a few self-defense skills. Um, and everything that, that we have to say is completely reflected in Wendy's presentation and in the material she presented from the book. So it was very reassuring to me to see that in all of the videos and the photos that we saw, all the techniques that they're practicing there are just the same principles and ideas and techniques that we teach today. And that's because it's none of it's a trick, it's not a gimmick, it's not something special that you have to learn from a trademark, licensed, specialized teacher. It's just the things that work best to do some damage and get ourselves out of a situation. So self-defense, as we define it in empowerment self-defense, is anything that you do to get yourself safely out of the situation. So that means, by definition, everybody that is in here today has already been practicing self-defense for some amount of years, less or more, depending on how many years you've been here. If you are here, and especially if you are a female identified or female perceived person, that means that you have been practicing self-defense pretty much every day for quite some time. Maybe on your way here, you practice self-defense by averting your gaze, by walking confidently, by choosing where you were on the sidewalk, by crossing the street because you felt uncomfortable, by defending yourself against a comment or an unwanted look or touch from someone on the street. All those ways that we practice self-defense in small ways all the time, that's what we consider to be self-defense. So already you're practic practitioners of self-defense. Yeah. So I'm just amazed how Appro I mean, how this is still true today in so many ways. And one of the things that we wanted to point out is that self-defense, the way we teach it, is really different from a long practice of a martial arts like jiu-jitsu, which would take a lot of practice. I mean, those throws, those are pretty amazing throws and those grabs and elbow braces and elbow breaks and things like that. So what we teach in self-defense is a lot simpler, very, very effective, it relies a lot on the fact that the element of surprise is working for us. Someone has targeted us, is approaching us, and we're not responding the way that the person expected us to. Simple techniques. Um, quick and dirty is what we say. I really appreciate it, actually, that you point out how much violence happens in the home with people who are familiar. I think that can't be stressed enough. I keep waiting for that to be part of the Me Too movement. I mean, you know, it's one thing with colleagues, it's one thing with um, people we know socially, it's another thing when we look at the real statistics of violence. So, self-defense, 
the best techniques that we know of are using our voice and running away. Getting away, getting out of the situation, making an assessment. This is not the place we want to be. Whether that's on the street and we're running away, or whether it's at a party where we're uncomfortable, or whether it's with the person that is uncomfortable, is where we just make a way to leave. To just get, and the voice, same thing. It doesn't have to be a, a yell. It can be a statement about, that's too close, I need to step away, I'm leaving now. Whatever, using our voice to say what we want to say. So those four principles of self-defense awareness, that is the way that what you were alluding to when you were saying already on the way here, chances are that we may have used some self-defense skills. They're so second nature, we don't even notice it anymore, right? The crossing the street, the noticing who's next to us. That's all awareness. So um, just... Place to use the yeah, give, give them the four, four and then, four we'll do and then you will yeah. do that. Okay, so awareness, assertiveness, using our voice, using our bodies to make a statement, claiming our space. Then physical techniques that's what everyone thinks of when they do self defense or when they come to a self defense class. That's actually for us only if uh, the awareness has not kept us safe. Only if the assertiveness has not stopped whatever action has happened, that's when those physical techniques come in. Hopefully we never have to use them. You know, sometimes we have people who come to the classes and who say, oh, this is really cool, I want to use it. And we say, well, no, actually you don't want to use it. You really want to get out before you have to use it. Finally, the fourth piece is recovery. That is, if something does happen, that we um, practice self-care. We really process what happened. We seek the help and support that we need. Right. Okay, so we're all going to practice a little self-defense right now. So uh, we're going to practice some awareness. So I'm going to ask all of you to close or lower your eyes. And with your eyes closed or lowered, I want you to point to one exit out of this room without opening your eyes. One exit out of this room. Okay, so keep your eyes closed and put your hand down. And point to another way out of this room. If that one was blocked, how else could you get out of here? And keep your eyes closed and put your hands down. That was scary. <laughs> Great. And point to a fire extinguisher. Okay, keep your eyes closed and put your arms down. Great. And then open your eyes and look around and check. Check your work. See how you did. Great. Did anyone see a fire extinguisher in this room? No? No. So the first level of awareness is a level of awareness that's about awareness of my surroundings. So that means noticing. When I go into a building, noticing. Is there another way out of this building? How did I get in? Which doors are blocked? Which windows open in this room? Who is, who is between me and the doors and the ways out of this room? Awareness of my surroundings. So in here, how do people do? How did people get an exit? You got the first exit because you came in that door. Did people get a second exit? Yeah. <laughs> you, got, you got it. Yeah, yeah, it's a little bit harder. But training myself to be aware of my surroundings so that rather than you know, I get on the airplane, I'm sitting there, I'm a captive audience, I'm forced to listen to where the exits are, and now I take it upon myself that when I go into a movie theater or a theater or a room like this, to take responsibility for being aware of my surroundings. Just like when I'm on the street, I notice, am I heading towards a darker part of the street or a lighter part of the street, paying, aware, paying attention to my surroundings? Okay, I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes again. Okay, now I want you to think of one of the people that is sitting closest to you in the room. And think of what that person looks like. What are they wearing? What color are their clothing? What color is their hair? Great. And then open your eyes and look around you. Check, see. Could you describe any of the people sitting closest to you in this room? So awareness of our surroundings also means awareness of other people. Just a basic awareness. And that act of paying attention to the people that are around me and purposefully noticing who they are, how they look, how they dress, and then further than that, how are they behaving, that act in itself can be somewhat of a radical act. So we, on most of us, on some level, know that we need to be paying attention to the people around us. And there is also a lot of information that tells us to not pay too close attention. You know you need to pay attention to keep safe, but don't be seen paying attention. So the, the radical act of noticing who is around me, noting, noting, is this person taller than me or shorter than me? Are they bigger than me or are they smaller than me? What were they wearing? As I walk towards 
people on the street noticing who is walking towards me, what does this person look like? And as I pass them, could I describe that person if I needed to a moment later? So awareness of other people. The next level of awareness is about awareness of myself. So being aware as I leave the house in the morning, how am I feeling today? How will I be perceived by others as I'm leaving my house? How will I be perceived by others the way that I'm interacting with my surroundings as I'm walking down the street, as I'm on the bus, as I'm getting into and out of my car? So how am I feeling and how is that affecting how I might respond if I needed to in a situation? Okay. That includes, I would say, how am I dressed? How am I dressed? I noticed those high heels when the last person yeah. who was doing all those major, amazing moves. Yeah. So if I'm wearing high heels, I want to think about what yeah. would I do if I had to run? Yeah. What would I do? Yeah. You know, how could I use these shoes to my advantage? Yeah. Or whatever. Yeah. You know, we don't ever give instructions or ideas, dress like this, avoid dressing like this. Those are our choices. But it's helpful to know what other, how other people may perceive us. Yeah. It's really helpful for us to be aware of that. So the second um, principle of self-defense is assertiveness. What do we mean by that? Um, it has a lot to do with how we hold ourselves. It has a lot to do with how um, we feel in our bodies, how we take up space. So um, I want you to think about or feel into how you're sitting right now and do something that makes you feel like you're sitting more assertively. So what do you do? Can you just throw off? Man spreading. Man spreading. Man okay. spreading. <laughs> Now we know why they do that, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anything else that yeah. somebody did? Sitting up straighter. Sitting up Sitting straighter, straighter. Yeah. yeah. That's what I noticed. Yeah. Anything else? Uncross your legs. Uncross your legs, yes. Legs. Yeah. Both, pe both feet on the floor, right? Yeah. So that was going to be my next question. How do you feel in relationship to the floor? Are you grounded in some way? Or are you like really seated in your chair? Or are you up in your head? Where is your awareness right now. That's just something that's good to practice, whether we are riding bard, or whether we're walking, whether we're standing someplace, just at the bank, for example, right? You're standing there, you're waiting, you're annoyed. Well, you could think about how is my posture right now? What kind of a body presence do I have right now? And um, so that's the first step of assertiveness, is really feeling myself and how strong I feel. I want to say that's kind of the word I want to use. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the other thing is about using our voice, and it's not so much about the words we choose. Actually, the words are not very important. The words are 93% of communication is nonverbal. That's what studies have shown. So that means the verbal part is 7%. That's not a lot. But how do each and every one of you use your voices? Are you um, somebody who speaks loudly? Are you the, the whole thing about calling attention to ourselves is so important, it's so ingrained in us not to call attention to ourselves, so raising our voice can sometimes be hard. We want to say in self-defense that it's not about yelling necessarily, although it would be, it's great to have that as a technique, but it's about using, it's about projecting. It's about using a voice, it's about projecting, it's, it's cultivating an idea that I don't mind being heard, and I don't even mind if I say the wrong thing. So what? Right? That, but that's something I have to cultivate. That doesn't necessarily come easy to me or to other people that I know. When it comes to yelling, ask you, I'm going to ask you right now to just check in with you. Do you know how to yell? Do you know how to be really not? We're not going to practice that here. But think about, imagine yourself calling a dog that's running away. Imagine yourself um, a child running out into the street. How loud you would be to get that child's attention. We want to be able to go from zero to 100 like that with our voice. It is such an amazing, effective weapon to have a loud voice that somebody comes up to you and you say, hey, you need to close, you need to step back. They don't step back, they don't step back, and you just raise your voice, step back! And it's like you're making a shield, and the other person like, whoa, I wanted to pick somebody who wasn't going to give me any trouble. No, that's enough. Yeah. A lot of times that's it. That's all it takes, using our voice. Yeah. Yeah, and remembering that assertiveness isn't about a certain script. I don't have to, have to know certain things to say that are the magical things to say, but assertiveness is about an attitude that I have about how much space I take up. So when you spread your legs and you sat with your feet planted and you put your arms out at the side and then you describe it as man-spreading, you know, that's, that oh, is great. Yeah, it does. It feels really good to say that I get to take up this much space. 
I get to take up this much space with my body and I get to make this much noise with my voice if I'd like to. Can anyone think of a time recently when they used assertiveness in their daily life? When, a time that you spoke up assertively, can you think of one? Oh, I could probably think of a hundred. Yeah? <laughs> what was, what was one that you used recently? Oh, <laughs> recently. Hmm. Somebody else has probably got a better okay. example right Anyone now. have an example of one? Yeah. Just shut the door in his face and lock the door. Yeah. Willing to sort of not have to worry about what, how this might affect that person and what their feelings might be. Sometimes, especially with a stranger, it's just that I shut the door in the face and I lock the door. It might be different when it's someone that we know, someone that we have an ongoing relationship with, and we have a stake in preserving that relationship. And because most of the violence, as we heard, comes from people that we are in relationships with of some sort, assertiveness in relationships with people that we know becomes even more important. And it's not, again, it's not so much exactly what I say, how I get my way out of this argument or win this argument on some logical basis, but it is about the way that I say it. Be wi being willing to say to the people that I know and love, this is what I need, this is the line across which you cannot come, and I'm willing to repeat that until you understand it. I'm willing to back that up. Yeah, one of the things that happens with assertiveness is that when we do make a limit or make a boundary, sometimes there's what we call the parting shot, that the person you've just done that with will say, oh, you so blah, 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 or you such a blah, 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 right? So to know that that can happen, that people want to come out winning. They don't want to say, oh, okay, sorry, I made a mistake, right? It's, that would be an option, but most people, most people who um, don't respect your boundaries won't respond like that. They'll respond in a way that we're kind of busy with that last statement for a while and we have to learn to let it go. We don't want to engage again because we want the situation to be over. You know, we're not going to turn around and say, what did you just say? No. We're just going to let it go, let it go, know that we got what we wanted, we're leaving. Yeah. So that's the interesting thing about self-defense, I think, is that sometimes people have the idea that self-defense means you want to fight, okay, I'll fight. But we don't think of it that way. We really don't think of it that way. We think of it as the most elegant, easy way to get out of a situation and go of pursue our lives, really. Yeah. Want to do a technique? The mugging first or technique Oh yeah, first? we can talk about mugging first. Okay, so in one of the things that happens is even though we know that 87% of the violence that women experience is gonna be at the hands of someone we know. It is true that the way that the self-defense classes and self-defense books and magazines have been sold over time is by hyping up the fear of the stranger and the other. And it is true that that, that job has worked really well. It's worked really well on me. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of times in my nightmares, the nightmare I have is of a stranger or a strange, strange monster even attacking me from behind all of a sudden in the dark. So even though this is a, the least likely thing to happen on some level, there is some importance to addressing it in the context of a self-defense class. Because the thing that is my deepest fear will sometimes be the thing that stops me from speaking up when it's not the most fearful thing happening. So I wanna know that I can take care of myself even when the thing that is my deepest fear happens. And in our area where we live, it's not so much necessarily someone jumping out of the dark, um, out, you know, jumping out of a tree and landing on me and taking me down, but there is a, a high media attention paid to, and there is some incidence of muggings, which is the basic interaction scenario where a stranger approaches me on the street and what they want from me is something that I have or possess. Um, and so addressing what to do in the case of a mugging is important. So what are some of the things that we can remember? Well, the first thing that we like to point out is there's a difference between an active weapon and a reactive weapon. So assume the mugger has a weapon or says that he has a weapon. I'm going to say see, he, he's a pronoun he. Uh, we don't know. I'm not going to check. I'm not going to ask. I'm just going to assume, okay, yes, he has a weapon. But I know that most, well, an active weapon is the one where you come into a room and you start shooting. You don't ask any questions. You don't want anything. You just want to shoot. You just want to shoot. A reactive weapon is one that is used in order to get something, in order to get a reaction. So the first thing I can, find, I can remember if there's a mugging is that 
chances are if the weapon is not um, discharged in the first few seconds, it's a reactive weapon. They're using it because they want something. So I think ahead of time, what am I willing to give up? This is something we can think about, or maybe you already or have thought about that, right? I, me, personally, I would give up just about anything. It's like, take it, sure, I'll give it to you, right? So the person is saying, give me your wallet, give me your bag, right? The, my most important thing is staying calm, because guaranteed this person isn't calm. They may look calm, but they're like, okay, let's get this over, let's, 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 I want to get what I want, right? So I need to stay calm. Again, I'm connecting with the floor, with the ground, wherever I am, okay. Hopefully I remember to take a breath, and I say, yes, my wallet, it's in my back pocket, I'm going to reach for it now, or my wallet, it's in my bag, let me take it out now, I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to describe what I do, because I don't want this person to think that I'm making any moves that might be threatening to them. What else would you add? I think thinking through the scenario and thinking, just like you said, am I willing to give up my phone? Am I willing to give up my laptop? Am I willing to give up my keys? Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a really important one. People are nervous about giving up their keys because they're afraid then that person has access to their house. So if I'm willing to give up my keys, because my keys, my wallet, and my cell phone are all in my bag. So if I'm willing to give up that bag, that means also, do I have a follow-up plan for myself? Do I have a person I can go to their house no matter what happens? Do I know where the nearest police station or fire station is or other place that is open and that I feel safe going to? So preparation, when it comes to these kinds of fears, preparation, and instead of avoiding thinking about the thing I'm most afraid of, actually shining a light on the thing I'm most afraid of mm -hmm. and thinking it through. Thinking it through, preparing myself by thinking through, and then what is my plan? So yes, if I give up my purse and it has my keys and my wallet and my cell phone in it, then will I go to a friend's house? And from that friend's house, will I sit with that friend and talk through what the next steps that I'm gonna do? Do I have another safe place to go? One thing we say sometimes when we're teaching students is, why is backing up your computer a good self-defense technique? Mm -hmm. Because I don't mind giving it up yeah. if I've backed it up. But if I haven't, and all my work for the last two years is on there, boy, I don't know. Yeah. You know, it would be really hard for a lot of people, right? The yeah. other thing is, once you know that you don't want your cell phone, your wallet, and your keys taken, put the keys someplace else. You yeah. can put the keys in your pocket. Most people don't want your keys. They want your wallet, they want your cell phone, right? So. Yeah. It's just helpful. Um, this is what I have learned from people I, who get in touch with me afterwards, if they've been held up and they say, that was really helpful because I didn't freak out completely. I was held up, but I didn't just lose it. I just stayed very present. And that we, some, somebody said once, a self-defense teacher said, uh, mugging is an unpleasant business transaction. This is not about our lives. If it's a mugging, it's not about our lives. That doesn't mean we don't need to go back to the fourth point of recovery. It doesn't mean that we don't want to talk to somebody about it, what happened. We need to, we need to repair our sense of safety after something like that happens. You know, we really do. So technique. Yeah. So one of the things we want, I want to say about the techniques, those were pretty tra practice techniques that we saw there, right? They were very elegant. They were very cool, right? They were cool. So in self-defense, it's not elegant. It's not even cool, except for the fact that you get out of the situation, right? There are techniques, you want, whatever you can think of, do it. Like, you know, if you happen to have, like all of a sudden you see, I don't know, say there's a stick laying and you can pick it up and you can use it, use it, right? Just do whatever you can do. We'll teach you one simple thing, and it's the one that is on Wendy's book cover. This technique to the, can I? Yeah. To the chin or to the nose, we call it the palm heel. It's this part of the palm, very hard, very good um, weapon, easier to use, easier to do than a fist, because all we have to really do is put our fingers back. I think we have enough room that you can all stand up. Would you be yeah. willing? <coughs> yeah. And then we want you to put one foot back a little bit, not on line, but get a sense that you're standing really strong here, right? And we're gonna put our hands up, and Aminta and I are going to do it, demonstrate it really, really slowly so you don't have to do it yet, you can just watch. We're going to come forward with one hand and pull it right back. And you're imagining a chin or a nose. Okay, you do the other hand. The, here's the thing, if I do this with my hand, that's good, 
But if I do this and put my whole body into it, that's more powerful. Okay, so you can practice this at home. We don't want to lean forward, we just want to be right in our power. So I'm going to count to three, and can we yell no? Okay, so one, two, three, and we're going to yell no, and we're just going to do it fast, this palm heel technique, okay? One, two, three. No! no! Again, one, two, three. No! And again? Yeah. One, two, three. No! Okay, we're going to do two in a row. So I'm going to count to three, and we're going to yell no, and then replace it with the other hand, no. So there's two strikes going out there. One, two, three. No, no! Just like that, one more time like that. One, two, three. No, no! Beautiful. So they showed this technique over and over again in the different, in the different pictures. Um, and it was shown like this, up under the chin. Uh, it can also go right to someone's nose. It can go right to their mouth. Um, they showed it where the, I was so close into the attacker that I was using the attacker for balance. Mm -hmm. as I did the palm heel strike. They also showed it where I was chopping the, tracker, the attacker's other arm uh -huh. as I was doing the palm heel strike. Yeah, the palm heel strike is super all around. And the thing is, it's, the reason it's so powerful is not just because of the impact, which is a powerful thing, but because the head moves. And the head is very heavy, and one th once the head moves, our whole body is going to try to regain our balance, right? So it's actually realistic that you fall, that the person would fall down. It's very realistic because they lose their balance and they just go down. Okay, so that wasn't just hokey. No, not at all. Okay, let's put our hands up and re, uh, redo that technique. And we're going to do three no's and then on the last one we're going to do a yes. Okay, so it's going to look like this. Watch me first. It's going to look like no, 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 yes. Okay, all together. One, two, three. No, 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 no yes. Great, that final yes was to defending ourselves. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Just to know about the part that you passed out, this is a, a forehand to hand. That's our school that we train at. And we, they actually train martial arts, Kaju Campbell, the martial arts of Mar Kaju Campbell, as well as teaching self defense classes. And the next self defense class, six week self defense class coming up, starts in May. And Amenda is the teacher. And they'll be another teacher, but so just so you know, we do it three times a year and pass it on to your friends, share the website, it's really great. When you ladies were talking about self defense, you were talking about people against people. Mm -hmm. Have yeah. you any comments about people against cars? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, actually I do. And and also people walking against cars and then people on bicycles against yeah. cars? Yes. yes. Yeah, both of those things. Um, all of the same ideas about self-defense, um, people against people, applies to people against cars. Because the first thing, the first idea of awareness, being aware of, of who I am, what's happening in my body, and how much attention am I, am I paying to what's going on around me, is the first part of self-defense against cars. Um, because if I think about my body, either walking on a bike against a car, a car is a much bigger, much faster, much more powerful opponent, if you will. Um, and so I want to treat it as such, and that means that when it comes to cars, it is all about my awareness. So it's about not texting while I'm walking across the street. I don't even talk on the telephone when I'm walking across the street. I, don't, I try not to text when I'm standing on an actual street corner where cars are taking the corner really fast, um, and big trucks especially. So all of that same idea of awareness and then also assertiveness, you know, that assertiveness of being able to be really clear about where am I? Am I standing in the place that I am supposed to be standing? Am I standing in the right place? Am I following the rules of the road as I'm the pedestrian? So those are the ways that I assert and, and stay aware to take care of myself when I'm walking on the street. And same thing when I'm biking. I think when it comes to bikes and cars, there can be some issues there around um, people wanting to engage in a battle of sort of who's right, who's wrong. Um, and just like in any other self-defense situation, for myself, what I think is, I want to get out of the situation safely no matter what. Mm -hmm. And I'm willing to give up being right in the moment in order to get out of there safely. And I'm going to go talk to my friends and work on the feelings I might have afterwards about the fact that I was right and that car driver was wrong. But I, got, I lived another day to talk about it and work it out. So, yeah, that's how I think about it. If, if I could, I'm a retired private investigator. They'll have some really serious 
difficult thing to tell you that you probably already know. But one of them is when you get in an elevator, always stand right in front of the panel mm -hmm. so that you can quickly push a button and you don't have to get around somebody to do that. Uh, another thing is don't go out with a lot of jewelry showing. Mm -hmm. um, it just attracts people, the wrong kind of people, right? I always have 911 on my cell phone and my finger really close to touching that button, if anybody looks strange to me. And so those are my big three to stay. Just don't attract people, and if you, if you are attracting, get the hell out of here. And you don't belong. You can wait for another day. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Wendy, I. I love your book, by the way, because it, I, it was, um, I knew there was something with, uh, particularly with the suffragist movement in England, and there was some jujitsu involved. I had no idea it was as, as big as it was, and, and the, the history that you brought out, so I was very excited by that. Why, and, and maybe it doesn't drop off as much as I think, but I really feel like there's this real gap between not just self-defense, but also general women's athletics in the early part of the 20th century and, say, 1975. And uh, just thinking my grandmother played basketball when I was in high school, there was no girls basketball. It comes along about five years after me. And then when my mother was in school, there was very little for girls. So d is there a drop off? And do you, do you have a historical opinion about why? <laughs> I don't really study that inner kind of period, but I do know, but in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s, there's much more emphasis on domesticity and women's places in the home, uh, right? Mm -hmm. Right, right, again, especially. The 50s housewife and that idea. So I think that that's a little bit of a response to the earlier period of more conservative kind of ideas of what women should be and what a woman should do. Um, so you definitely see that in between the, the, the extremes of the movements for women's rights. So hopefully we don't make that same slide yeah. right. right now. All right. Well, we have this book for sale. We went to buy a little reception of wine and snacks and things like that. So if you stay at the exhibition, the space is yours for tonight. Enjoy it. Talk to him the hands more and come back and see us sometime. Thank you, Patty. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.